Ah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the True Crime Banter podcast YouTube channel. Uh, something unfortunate happened. Something unfortunate happened while recording this first episode, and that something unfortunate is that the battery in my camera that I used to record it uh, is shot for some reason. For some reason, it, it can't record more than like 10 seconds without it saying it overheats. So I'm going to have to uh, get that addressed and get that resolved. But until then, until I do solve that issue, uh, we're going to be uploading the audio-only version of the podcast. And that's what this video is right here. So uh, yeah, that's unfortunate, especially for episode number one. Why, why did it have to happen on episode number one? Who knows? It's just life. Life happens. But anyways, here you guys are the first episode of the True Crime Banter podcast. Uh, we start off slow. We do. But we gain some steam. We gain some momentum in the middle. And then, boom, just end it abruptly. Hope you guys enjoy it. Let's go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, what's going on, sir? There's a body in my son's apartment. There's a what? A body. A dead body. A dead body? Are you sure, sir? I can think he's cold, man. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> he's cold. Okay, hold on just a minute. Is it someone that you know, sir? I have no idea who she is. I don't know what's going on. Does your son know who it is? He's not here. Jesus, honey. Okay. Do you know where your son is? No, I don't. I don't. He's so tall. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. What's doing? What's happening? Shout out to Frazier and welcome, everybody. Welcome to the True Crime Banter Podcast. Uh, the podcast aimed to bring in you your dose of murder relaxation. And uh, we're, we, we did it. We're here. We're at episode one. Uh, I gotta admit, I'm a little frazzled right now. I'm a little frazzled, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you about why I'm a little frazzled in today's bit of banter, which we're gonna start every episode off with a bit of banter. Um, and what is a bit of banter? I'm gonna tell you right now, real quick. We're gonna talk real quickly about something and anything. Or maybe sometimes nothing. Uh, no, we're going to be using the bit of banter, the daily bit of banter, or per episode, talking about really anything, whether it is uh, a situation that is ongoing in pop culture, or I guess not pop culture, but popular in time, in real lifetime true crime, I suppose, similar to like the Gabby Petito case uh, over the past couple months, or... We're going to talk about something that has nothing to do with true crime, whether it is what kind of IEMs am I using? My in-ear monitors, they are uh, very comfy, and someday I will tell you guys about them. But today's not the day, because today I'm going to tell you why I am flustered. Uh, episode one, we are here, and if you guys don't know, the True Crime Banter podcast is a video podcast as well, so you can go to YouTube.com. Uh, and just search True Crime Banter Podcast, and we should, you should be able to, to find us. Yeah. Uh, my name is Riley, by the way. I am your guys' host for today. I may not be the only host this entire show for this episode for sure, but I mean the show in general. Uh, I may have a guest host that pops in every once in a while, but today it is just me, and the moment I hit record... The moment I hit record for this first episode, my dog, our dog, started barking like a mofo. And I'm not I'm not just saying this because it's like, you know, it's it's a dog stuff. I'm saying this because uh we just adopted him three days ago. Uh five year old little I don't know, half dachshund, half they say chihuahua. I don't we don't really think he has any chihuahua in him, but Definitely some terrier, some sort of thing, but cute little dude. Uh, he was found in Mexico wandering the streets back in August, and here he is now up here in the Seattle area 
just enjoying the beautiful, hot, sunny weather. Yeah, it is uh, It is quite the uh, culture shock because I'm a cat guy, for those of you who don't know me, which is going to be probably all of you, unless you're like my family and friends that choose to support me, but you probably don't because you're all losers, just like myself. Uh, no, I'm, I'm a cat guy, and I've had dogs. We've had family dogs, but this is the first time it is like, a dog that I got to take care of. I got to make sure it gets out on the walks on time. I got to make sure it's not, you know, shit in the bed or in the house. And I got to take it outside for walks. I mean, it's already more than I have to do with cats. So not a huge fan, but I'm lying. I am. He's cool. Anyways, uh, back to the bit of banter. Yeah. The moment I press record, I just hear this crazy freaking barking going on out there. And I'm like, Bro, what what is going on? Because he's not a yappy dog. He doesn't uh, sit there like your typical small dog and just bark, 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 bark. No, he's very chill. Very, very chill. Perfect for someone like me who prefers cats. However, he was barking. And this was the second time today that he was just barking in our bedroom. So I walk in there and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? And what is it? He is sitting on the bed, staring at a mirror on our bathroom door, barking at himself. I, I don't even know what to, like, do in that situation. I can't be like, yo, that's you. And, like, wh- also, why are you choosing to bark at yourself now? You, 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 he'll stare at himself in the mirror for minutes, just staring, and then walk away. But now the moment I press record... He's like, you know what, I'm not, that, that dog in the mirror is a little sketchy, little, little, uh, I don't really know about him. So, anyways, I press record, I hear the bark, and I gotta stop recording, go out there, figure that shit out, and now here we are. I came back in here, obviously, and uh, we're here, and uh, <laughs> that's gonna wrap up today's bit of banter. Uh, I don't know if you guys have dogs out there or if you're cat people like me but uh especially on on the youtube channel if you're watching this on youtube in the comment section below let me know if you're a cat person or a dog person and what kind of cat or dog you got is it a Maine coon or is it a great dane i don't know but today we're gonna be talking about some true crime as we do here at the true crime banter podcast today we're gonna be talking about the case of daniel wozniak and uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about that 911 phone call that we opened up this episode with. Whose body is this? Whose body is this? Where's the caller's son? And simply put, just what the hell happened? So we're going to go ahead and go back to that 911 phone call. By this time, we're going to listen to a little bit more of it because that was just a short snippet. We're going to listen to an extended version and unreleased, not unreleased, you guys have I have it here, so it's not unreleased. Uh, we're, let's just hop right into it. Let's get into this 911 phone call and uh, really dive deep. Okay, what's going on, sir? There's a body in my son's apartment. There's a what? A body. A dead body. A dead body? Are you sure, sir? I can take you so, man. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> Cold. Okay, hold on just a minute. Is it someone that you know, sir? I have no idea who she is, but I don't know what's going on. Does your son know who it is? He's not here. Jesus, honey. Okay. Do you know where your son is? No, I don't. I don't. He's so soft. <laughs> okay. Just keep breathing for me, sir, okay? Where in the apartment is she? She's in the bedroom. She's like, there's some sexual activity. She's dead. There's blood from her head. I, 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 I thought she was just she was cold. There was blood from her head? Yeah. Honey, I, mean, I don't know what to say. I, okay, I, just stay in there, okay? I see her. She's a Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it is, but it is it clear it is? All right, so there we are. That is, uh, that caller is... That is the voice of Steve Hare. He is the father of former, not former, but military private first class Sam Hare, hence his son. And uh, he just walked into his son's apartment and came upon the lifeless body 
of young Julie Kibuishi. Let's talk about first off. I want to br- I want to tell you guys about Julie real quick. Twenty three years old, uh, and her and Sam, the son of Steve, who is the nine one caller, they are friends. They they're hanging out, and some of their group of friends aren't really sure. Are you guys dating? Are you not dating? Like they they have a very um, flirtatious relationship. So as some of them would the the friends would describe it, were unsure of their exclusivity when it came to uh, Julie and Sam. So Julie, uh, yeah, she's found on not on I guess in the bedroom of Sam Hare. Uh, partially on the bed and partially off the bed. So they say her legs were on the ground, but her upper body was on the bed. If you're watching the video podcast, it'd be something like something like that ish. I, I don't know. I'm not going to, uh, I'm really not going to get up and try to show you guys how it was. It's a little too much, you know, maybe I'll throw a picture up or something. Not too graphic though. Uh, anyways. Yeah. So, Sam's father, Steve, walks in and sees Julie's body with a gunshot wound to the back of her head. I couldn't imagine, I could not imagine at all what that would be like. And, you know, fingers crossed I never have to uh, come upon something like that. But let's, let's talk about why, why Steve, Sam's dad, is there in the first place. Well, Sam and his parents, Steve and his lovely wife, which I shall not name because I actually didn't look it up. Uh, I guess they got a pretty close relationship. Uh, Sam will typically spend, not every weekend, but he'll he'll do some weekend trips and hang out with his family for a couple days and then obviously come back and, uh, you know, back to the real world and live on his own. And uh, this weekend, this is, by the way, this is back in May of 2010 down in Orange County, California. This weekend uh, was one of those weekends where he was going to be hanging out with his parents. Well, he never showed up. He never showed up. And of course, you know, as responsible parents do, they are wondering, hey, is everything okay? Where are you at? What's going on? So they call him. He's not answering. They call him again. He's still not answering. And, and Steve just says, fuck it. I'm, I'm driving over. I want to make sure everything's all right. And I don't know if you guys are, are like this. I, I'm, I'm pretty close to being like this. So I will, uh, you know, if I'm supposed to be meeting up with somebody and they're not showing up or if I'm expecting someone to be somewhere and and for some reason I'm not seeing them, I'll, be, you know, shoot them a text. Hey, you here? And if no response, you know, everything good? You good? I'll send another text. And if it's somebody that I really truly uh, am worried about or care about and we really want to make sure they're safe, I'll I'll call them after two or three non-responsive texts and uh, I'll call them a couple times just to really make sure, hey, things are good. And and maybe, you might say, dude, Riley, that's that's too much. Like, one text, I'm outie. See ya. I don't give a damn. Yeah, I'm not like that. I might be overstepping myself sometimes and, and, and be too... I'd rather be be too cautious than um, careless or too careless. I don't know how you would say that, but I, I would prefer to go the route of just being more sure that somebody is safe than, than not safe. So back to the story. Steve takes it a step further again. I don't think I would drive to the son's house unless you know it is really uh, a situation that doesn't make sense and then I really need to figure out why but uh, Steve Steve Hare or her so H-E-R-R is the last name I'm gonna say Hare I've heard it pronounced both ways I like the word Hare I like the name Hare the word her I don't I digress Steve says, you know what, this is not like Sam. I need to go make sure he's okay. So he drives down and obviously comes upon Julie's body and uh, not what he was expecting. And, you know, no one's really expecting ever to walk in on a dead body. But especially in a situation where you're already probably worried that something's happened to your son. Uh, You don't even know who this girl is and all of a sudden... 
she's there and dead. The police get called, and uh, obviously they do their due diligence, and they start looking into the, the scene and figuring out what is going on here. And on Julie's cell phone, they actually find the following text messages, which give me a moment here as I pull them up. And these are text messages from Sam to Julie. Text message number one says, Can you come over tonight at midnight alone? Going out for a bit. Very upset. Need to talk. Second text says, Please don't tell anyone. Please. And the third and final says, Please, no sex. I need to talk to someone. I'm really not doing well. So, it does sound like Sam and Julie, maybe they're not in a, a committed relationship or an exclusive relationship, but they are friends with benefiting it. They are doing the no strings attached. You don't just say no sex to somebody that you're not having sex with. You say no sex if it's on the table for some reason or another. And you got to take it off the table. Hence the text. So the police are thinking, okay, we, we, this is our dude. You know, we've got the text between him and Julie. He's nowhere to be found. So it's got to be him, right? The old adage, the husband did it. Well, they do a little bit of more background, background checking on Sam Hare. And they find out eight years prior to this, so what, 2002? Quick math? Real good. Eight years prior to this, he was arrested and charged for capital murder. Now, he was never convicted of it, but just to be arrested and charged for it, you know, says something. So they're like, all right, all right, whatever we got to do, let's find this Sam Hare. So they're talking to the parents. They don't know where he's at. You know, they tried getting a hold of him. They don't know what's going on. They're doing uh, just a little more investigation work. You know, they're trying to find him. They're trying to find where did he go? Is he is he skipping town or is he going on an insane spree? And, you know, when you're in the military, it's PTSD is a thing. Not an excuse to kill somebody, but it does happen, you know whether it's somebody else or your own self, unfortunately. But it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. So they're thinking, okay, we got to find this guy as soon as we can, you know, figure out what's going on. But they don't, really have, they don't really have leads. They don't really know, you know, anything. I mean, they know his background, but they don't know where he would even go from here until something pops up in Sam's credit card was used at an ATM nearby in Long Beach, California. So what do they do? Well, you, as anybody would expect, they, uh, they call up that bank that the ATM was used for and pull the surveillance. And they pull that surveillance. And what is on that surveillance footage? A gentleman? That is not Sam Hare. That's unfortunate. I mean, who's this dude then? This guy has a credit card of some dude who is missing who has a dead body in his bedroom in his apartment. This guy knows what is going on. This guy is the guy to find now. But how do you do that? How do you find somebody based off of a grainy surveillance footage that you can't even tell really who it is? You know, and this is back in 2010. So, obviously, yes, technology was advanced. And even right now, nowadays, I don't think they had the technology to even look at this surveillance footage and be like, okay, well, it's this guy. You know, unless, unless they pull up his Apple ID. Anyways, they are doing everything they can to find out who this dude is using Sam Harris' credit card at this ATM pulling cash out. And uh, they got They got nothing. You know, it's it's a tough ask. It's a tough ask. They got nothing until <laughs> until there's a second transaction. This time, pizza place, baby, pizza place. First off, how should I say this? If you were going to steal somebody's credit card, the last thing I would suggest you do with that credit card is order pizza for delivery to your house. I'm not saying, you know, it is a, uh, it, no, I am saying that this is probably like 
top five dumbest things you could do when committing a crime other than like calling the police prior to you committing the crime to tell them you're going to commit the crime. That might be number one. I think number two is probably ordering pizza to deliver to your own house with a credit card that you stole from somebody. So this guy, <laughs> this guy in the, uh, in the surveillance footage, well, well, he did exactly that. He, he placed the order and told them, yep, this is where I live. Bring it on through. So what did the police do? Well, of course, they got a hold of the delivery driver, um, stopped him before he got to the house, and they verified. They made sure that, okay, yep, yeah, this is Sam Harris' credit card. Uh, we're not tripping balls here and thinking that, uh, you know, somehow we made a mistake. No, they verified. And then they got the address, and then they got the SWAT team, and they went to work. By went to work, I mean they went to the address. They, they, they went to the house. Now imagine this, okay? First, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you like this. They go to the house. Who opens up the door? Sixteen-year-old boy, whose name we shall not name. He who must not be named is this sixteen-year-old boy ordering pizza with the credit card of Sam Hare, who is missing. So what the hell at first? Can you guys imagine? Imagine being a teenager and you order pizza and then a SWAT team arrives instead of your pizza delivery guy. You open the door, knock, knock, who's there? Not Mr. Pepperoni, it's Mr. Slappy in the face with those giant door breaking rods. I, you get, If you guys aren't watching the video podcast, I'm doing something weird. <laughs> fucking so weird with my hands i just looked at myself in the camera and holy you guys got to see that or maybe don't maybe i'll cut that out probably not anyways so they get to this house a 16 year old opens the door not it's not sam hair obviously uh it is the guy on the surveillance footage but he has an excuse as to why he's using sam Hare's credit card and the police do their due diligence again and he checks out. This 16-year-old says, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I don't know. I don't know who, who Sam Hare is. I don't know who does Julie Kibuishi is either. I, I, all I know is that there was this gentleman named Daniel Wozniak, and he told me to pull some money out, and he would give me some of it, and then he let me order up a pizza. Now, I don't know how you guys were when you were 16 years old. I know, uh, you know, we're all not the brightest at that age. But if you got a guy asking you to pull money out of what he is claiming to be his own bank account, and he will give you money for doing that, uh, that's probably not his bank account, which is the situation here. So... Now, the police, though, they got a lead. They're like, okay, your story checks out. Now explain us, to us again who this, this Daniel Wozniak guy is. And he, this, the kid doesn't really know the guy. He just he thought he was helping him out, right? But they got a name, and they look it up. And what do you know? Daniel Wozniak lives in the apartment complex that Sam Hare lives in that Julie Kibuishi's body was found in dead shot to the back of her head in his bedroom that's the man he knows something Daniel knows something about what the hell happened and where the hell is Sam Hare at so where oh where is the neighbor of Sam Hare and if I'm being honest that is why I choose to pronounce it as hair instead of her, because I wrote this up earlier and I, I wrote where I'll wear it's a neighbor of Sam Hare, and I could not uh, could not wait to use that. Anyways, backstory on Daniel Wozniak. Daniel Wozniak, he is a 26-year-old aspiring theater actor. Acting, acting, you know, those theater actor guys i mean he is in orange county california so i guess that makes sense that's a i would think that's a pretty good 
area to be in if you're trying to be an actor, even if it's a theater actor. So yeah, I mean, and and from from what uh, my research 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 that's a tough word from what my research shows i mean he was a pretty pretty solid uh lead man i mean i guess he had a good charismatic personality and a good voice and could sing and and really really act you know a lot of a lot of people were looking for people like him and the reason why though not just because he's capable but it's because he was available to. So he is a 26-year-old guy that really wasn't into the whole like uh, working deal. He wanted to be, he wanted to live the life of an actor. So instead of getting a, a consistent paying job, he was choosing, I'm going to do these acting roles. And so having, I, I could just imagine being a community theater actor, like, you, if you want to put on a good play, you need someone to really commit to it. And he was willing to commit to it. I mean, it sounded like he loved it. And not only did he love that, he also loved his girlfriend turned fiance, not just turned fiance. They were actually getting married with it this next weekend of all this shit going down at their apartment complex. His fiance, Rachel Buffett, is also an actress. And they they act in plays together, which I guess makes sense. I mean, you know, you always see in Hollywood, this guy, you know, Jennifer Lopez and whatever other celebrity are are now dating. And now they're not dating. And they're dating again. And then they're not dating. And then she's on a boat. And now he's on a boat. And they're on the boat together now. And now they're not on the boat. And they're on separate boats together now. And that's, you know, that trickles all the way down to community theater. Who would have known? Back to the story. Um, yeah, so him, his fiance Rachel Buffett, and co-star Rachel Buffett, uh, they're getting ready to get married this next weekend, and all this stuff's going down at their apartment complex, and they don't really know what the hell's going on, and neither does the police. I mean, the police are just saying, hey, we're getting your name from a 16-year-old that says you're giving him Sam Harris' credit card to take some money out. You got to tell us what the hell's going on and where the hell Sam is at. And so what do they do? They they search for him. They, they, they're they trying to find him. They can't find Daniel Wozniak anywhere. They're like, are you serious? Like, really? I mean, this dude, prominent actor in the OC area. And he's going to be able to evade us? I mean, yeah, I would just walk down the street be like, hey, you seen, seen Dan W? Oh, yeah, Dan W from the, the, the thing, the thing down the road. Yeah, he was just down there. I don't know if that's actually how things went from what it was described. That's what it seems like. Like they were just these investigators and, and uh, um, I'm forgetting the word. I can't remember the word. I love it when this happens. Anyways, these detectives, that's the word I'm looking for. These investigators and these detectives, they're looking for Daniel Wozniak any way possible. And it sounds like they were just going from bar to restaurant to shop to store all along this like beach coast front that I guess Daniel Wozniak was known to um, frequent. And they were coming up with nothing, just nothing. That is until they come across this restaurant named Tsunamis or something like that. And they go into the back bar area and there he is, Daniel Wozniak taking shots with his buddies. So this is actually... Uh, those detectives that were searching for him. And this is what they said, I think it was to ABC or something on 2020. Uh, Listen to this. Daniel saw me, he turned white, and you could just see kind of the blood draining from his face. Police literally walk in and arrest him in the middle of his bachelor party. And as we walked out, said, I'll tell you everything you want want to know. I'm not going to protect him anymore. So... Daniel Wozniak is kind of expecting this. He, he, the police are there, and he knows why. And he knows what's going on. At least he thinks he knows what's going on. And uh, so they say, all right, come on, let's talk. They, they, they bring in Daniel Wozniak, and they're interrogating him. And, and he says, you know what? First off, I got to tell you, 
at this point, Daniel does not know that there is actually a dead body found in the apartment of Sam Hare. So he's sitting there and he thinks this entire thing is about some credit card fraud scam that him and Sam decided to set up. And the idea, of course, was to get some stupid American, no, stupid 16-year-old American to, (laughs) I guess, take money out of Sam's account. That way it would be his face on the surveillance footage. They would give him a, a, a little cut, take the rest of the money between Sam and Dan, Sam and Dan, Dan and Sam, and uh, split that money, and then Sam would call his bank and say, hey, my credit card was stolen. They would reimburse him for that money, and then boom, he's basically doubled his money, if not, you know, uh, however much he wants to. Well, it would be doubled, but then he's cutting it. Ah, yeah, you know, he's making money off of some fraudulent activities. So that's what Dan says. Daniel Wozniak is trying to explain, hey, um, this is what it was and I'm sorry you know you got us you got me and at this point you might be wondering wow did uh did Sam Hare plan all this out you know he's he's in the military he understands uh precision I guess or planning things out in a way that works you would hope and so are you thinking that Yo, did did Sam set up Dan to then start this interrogation process to to buy himself more time to get away after shooting Julie Kibuishi in the head? And uh, well, let's uh, let's just continue. So during the initial questioning, Dan Wozniak is talking to these investigators, and uh, he, he tells them the the following story. So this is what he says happened the next morning after their first attempt of the credit card fraud. I told him the door and I was I'm like, hey, you know, what's going on? Everything good? He's like, not good. I did something bad. What did you do? He's like, there's a, a body in my apartment. I shot somebody. I was not happy about it. It was a fit of rage. So there we are. Uh, Daniel Wozniak says, Sam Hare comes to his apartment, says, hey, dude, you know, there's a body in my apartment. I shot someone in a fit of rage. Lo and behold, shocker, Dan Wozniak does know about Julie in Sam Hare's apartment. Immediately, red flags. You know, investigators were wondering, what the, what the hell? So, so where is, where is he? Where is Sam? Where did he go? And, you know, Mr. Wozniak himself says, I, I just don't know. I have no idea. And he gets a little frazzled and and so so they they start asking dan mr dan where were you the night that that sam shot julie so dan explains hey i'm i was over in fullerton i was in a play or a nine the musical is what he he called it and and he was obviously with his fiance his co-star and he describes that they were in the play we went home had sex and went to sleep that's how he describes it. And for some reason, that just felt a little off to me. Just the way he said it. We went home, had sex, and went to sleep. Like, I don't know. The, the very uh, nuanced way of boom, boom, boom. It's like, oh, just a little weird, you know? Something didn't fit right for me. And you guys can hear this uh, if you if you search Dan Wozniak interrogation. It just, I wasn't a fan of the way he said that, so... Then Dan explains that the next morning, Sam showed up at his door and says, we need to get going, we're in trouble. And then they dip. So so Dan takes off with Sam, and while driving, Sam explains exactly the quote that you heard earlier. He said, there's a dead body in my apartment. I shot somebody, it was a fit of rage, etc., etc., etc. So investigator they start to pick up on something they realize each time dan is is explaining everything that happened that next day something either changes or gets added and and in general all of this just it's not adding up something is off in my own words and they're 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 saying something's just not right it's not the same story every single time so to give you guys an idea 
here is one of the <laughs> one of the additions that that Daniel Wozniak added to his story with Sam. He said, well, I know where he lives. Okay. And I said, yeah, you do know where I live. It's like, you wrap me out, I'm going to kill you. And better yet, I'm going to start with your wife. So Daniel Wozniak is now saying that Sam Hare, while driving, basically he, Daniel is, he's driving Sam to deliver him to a place that he can basically get away. And Sam is saying, hey, you know what the fuck happened. And I'm going to do the same thing to you if you try to rat me out. But I'm going to start with your wife first because he knows that that him and Rachel, they they got this wedding coming up and they're so pumped. And he Sam knows, hey, if I want to hit him where it hurts, I'm going to bring up his bring up, bring up Rachel, bring up his co-star. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's pretty clear. I mean, you would think right off the rip, Dan would want to bring that up. You know, Dan would be like, hey, listen, Sam threatened me. And that's why I felt like I had to do what he wanted me to do and what he wanted him to do was basically that uh deliver him to an area to get away without being known so dan explains yeah i I took him to this mall dropped him off with some dude in a black baseball cap and i don't know where they went after that well a little bit later daniel wozniak starts to break a little bit he explains, okay, well, listen, 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 listen. That guy with the black baseball cap, he's not real. He's made up. And I, I made him up because I know that I was the last person known to be with Sam Hare. Granted, my fiance is the only one that knows I was with him. But I thought, you know what? If I make something up and I say he was with somebody else the last time I saw him, then I can be, you know, less responsible for what he did and what I'm helping him get away with. That's that's convenient, you know, that you could just make somebody up. But here he is, and under, under interrogation, they always get you. You know, they always, they always get you in one way or the other. So now that Dan has admitted uh, that he's, basically been an accessory after the fact to the for the murder of julie kibuishi and he's helped sam Hare get away the investigators then ask him for a dna swab they say hey let us just get a dna swab just to clear you of any possibility that you were involved in julie's death so after the swab the investigator asks if there's any reason his dna would be anywhere at the crime scene and good old ben Good old Banny, good old Danny boy, uh, goes ahead and says this. Let me pull it up for you guys. Here's what Danny had to say when asked, uh, you know, there's no reason why his DNA would be at the crime scene. Now, I was in Sam's apartment Friday afternoon. Okay. And I know I did use the bathroom. You did use the bathroom? I used the bathroom, um, and I went... I'm not sure if I went out on the patio time. Where's that DNA going to show up? Um, uh, in Sam's car. What about on Julie? No, I wouldn't be on Julie. Did you see Julie get in the apartment? No, I did not. No, I did not. No. You better think about that. So, you can tell the investigators are saying, hey, dude, you better get your, get your shit straight. Think about what you're saying, because, uh, uh, I we need to know. We need to know. So, um, yeah, it, it's pretty clear that Daniel Wozniak knows more than he's actually sharing. So, uh, after hours of this interrogation and a DNA swap, Daniel thinks, hey, listen, I've told you everything I could. I've, I've given you the DNA swab. I think I just said swap. I've given you the DNA swab. Time for me to go home. Except... He's not. Here's what happened when Daniel Wozniak realized, re realized, realized he was under arrest for accessory to murder. Something. Absolutely. Yeah. You're arrested for what? Uh, 
for murder. Okay, accessory to murder. That's what you're being arrested for. You don't want to talk to us, to us anymore? That's, that's okay, it. Okay, yeah, we're well, done. Hold on. We're well, done. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. We're done. Unless you want to talk to us, we're done. I will talk to you about anything if it gets me to my wedding on Friday. No. That's what I will promise. I will talk talk to you about anything if it gets to me gets me to my wedding. What else did he have to say? Yeah, you got the answers. You can help us. I don't know what else you want me to say. I don't know. Tell us. I don't know. Tell us the truth. You're not that good of an actor. Damn, shots fired. You're not that good of an actor. Damn, he went for it. You're not that good of an actor. And, uh, well, speaking of acting, listen to this clip. Okay, fine. You know what? He didn't come down. He came down and said, help me. I went upstairs, and yes, I saw the body. Is that what you want to hear? No. We want to hear the truth. <sighs> that is the truth. So it's pretty clear, uh, you know, Dan, the acting man, is, is cracking a little bit. He, he's losing his temper and uh, can't keep his story straight. So, so what does the interrogation team do? The oldest trick in the modern playbook. Hey, uh, Danny boy, you remember that DNA swab we took from you? Well, guess what? It's a match for DNA found on Julie's body. Explain that. And as I'm sure most of you true crime fans already know, this is how interrogations can go. I mean, as the perpetrator, you're expected to be 100% honest and truthful, and they want the the absolute truth from everything that you say but that same thing does not go for the investigators you know and, and i think it's expected that they should uh be honest and truthful with the investigators towards or the interrogators towards the the um you know person in question but they they kind of get around those rules and they'll they'll ask something like now why would somebody say they saw you at the crime scene Rather than just saying somebody saw you at the crime scene, because they're not, they're not explicitly saying somebody saw you. They're asking a question: Why would somebody say you say they saw you? And and you know, it's it's something that it it's been known. You know, if you're a good interrogator, that's that's what you do, and that's what you do. But sometimes uh, those same old tricks can get some people wrongly convicted. However, this is not one of those cases. So Wozniak admits that yes, he did go up to Sam's apartment after Sam shot Julia. And that is how his DNA got there. And here is Dan, the acting man, explaining what he saw when he was there. And, and you can really start to hear how flustered Dan, Dan really is when he's talking about this. I saw two gunshots in her head. And I saw her pants like ripped and cut and I saw like F you written on the back of the shirt where were the two bullet wounds I don't know Sam said he shot her twice okay and but you I just, saw I you saw just, I didn't see you just told us you saw two bullet wounds you were no, standing no, no, over no 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 okay. stop okay how did your DNA get on I was standing over the body I saw two bullet wounds to her head second so scene then you can't even keep your lies straight. Yeah, so they're really, uh, they're really going after Dan on this one, and uh, that—that's the clip right there. That was the clip right there, and that was when detectives knew that Dan was lying about something. He was lying about a lot of things, and uh, you might be asking, well, how? Well, just because he—he might be a little flustered, you know, like I was at the beginning of this episode. And uh, maybe he just can't keep his story straight because his brain is just being over uh, overwhelmed with all this stuff going on. But no, there was one single sentence that Daniel said during this little clip, and I'll play it again. And you guys let me know if you caught it. I saw two gunshots in her head. And I saw her pants like ripped and cut. I saw like where were the two bullet wounds? I don't know. Sam said he shot her twice. Okay. And but you I just, saw, I you saw, just, I didn't see, you just told us you saw two bullet wounds. You were no, standing no, over. No, 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 okay. Whoa, 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 okay. stop. 
Okay. How did your DNA get on? I was standing over the body. I saw two bullet wounds to her head. You can't even keep your lies straight. All right. Did you guys catch it? Did you guys catch the uh, the sentence that he said? Uh, well, I'll play it one more time, but this time we're not gonna we're not gonna play it for too long. Not the entire thing. Just one more quick quick clip. Let me know if you hear the sentence as to what made detectives know this guy's lying to us. I saw two gunshots in her head, and I saw her pants like ripped and cut. I saw like F- you written on the back of the shirt. Did you guys catch it? Did you catch it? Well, let's uh, let's let's dig a little deeper. Ah, well, because of the nature of Julie Kibuishi's death, gunshot to the back of the head, uh, detectives knew that there was no way that you could tell if there was two gunshot wounds to the back of her head or not. Because she had dark hair, because of the nature of, of a wound like that, you can't know that there are two bullet holes in the back of a person's head unless you're, you know, invasively inspecting it or you know what happened, you know, unless you know a little bit more than what you've told investigators. So, well, this is what happens. Mr. Wozniak just says, screw it. I'm, I'm, I'm done talking to you guys. Throw me back in the cell. Um, I'm, I'm done talking. So they do that. They throw him back in the cell and a little bit of time passes and, and Daniel gets to call his wife to be Rachel and Miss Rachel Buffett. Um, She's been through a little bit as well. You know, she has also been arrested and charged with accessory to matter to matter accessory to murder after the fact. Um, She actually posted bail, though, so she was out free. But she's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. Or I guess in this case, uh, between love and freedom. And the reason being is because she's got some info. She well, uh, we're going to listen to this jail cell phone conversation that her and Daniel had just after Rachel had spoken to Daniel's brother, Tim, on the phone. What did you do? I helped Sam cover some stuff up and helped him get some drugs. That's it. I didn't murder anybody. My mom's working on canceling all the wedding plans now, and I just talked to Tim, and I need to make a phone call to the detective now. Why? Tim says he has evidence with them, or, or he knew where it was, or something. Then I'm doomed. What? Tim said that? Yeah, do you know that Tim has some evidence? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Well, this is, this is ridiculous, and I have to go tell the detectives no, the truth. No, no I, don't, I was... don't, 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 that can't be found. All right, well, you guys can clearly hear in Danny's... Daniel, Danny Boy's voice there, that he's, uh, he's a little worried about the evidence that his brother Tim has. Whatever that evidence may be, he knows that it is, uh, it's not going to bode well for him. And so in this next part of that same conversation, uh, it's clearly shown his stress, or should I say, uh, I guess comfort now? Comfort? Listen here. No, babe, I'm going to do it. Listen to me. No. no. What? Trust me, please. I have to tell the truth on what I did. And I think you now know what it is. And it's bad. Imagine the worst, and that's what I did. Imagine the worst, and that's what I did. And, uh, well, I think we both know how that went. So, Daniel Wozniak goes ahead and requests to talk to the investigators again. And, uh, here's what he said to them. You said you wanted to talk to me. What's going on? I'm crazy and I did it. You did what? I killed Julie and I killed Sam. Okay. Uh, tell me how you uh, you killed Sam. Two shots using oh. my father's gun that I had. And your motive behind uh, uh, killing Sam was? Money and insanity. Money and insanity. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about uh, uh, the Sam incident and what you did. Um, I told him that I needed to move some stuff from the theater. 
I said, you need to bend down and help me lift this thing up. And when he bent down, I grabbed the gun. I never really fired the gun before, so I pulled it back and I shot him. So he, he admits it. He, he did it. He shot Sam and he killed Julie. But uh, let's, let's hear a little bit more about what he has to say about the whole situation. Sam is decapitated. Okay. He's at the military base. All right. In the theater. In the theater. If you go up the ladder from the theater, his head and hands have been decapitated, as well as his arm that had a tattoo. And you did it? Yes. Jesus. This piece of fucking shit. There it is, the confession and a small glimpse into, you know, the gruesome details of what Daniel Wozniak did to Sam Hare. But it gets worse, and I get it. How? How does it get worse? Let's end this real quick for you guys. First off, he he explains the events as follows. He asks Sam to help him down at the theater on the military base. Shoots him in the back of the head, but guess what? Sam didn't die. Sam wasn't dead. He just he, he missed somehow, you know. He shot him in the back of the head, but it didn't kill him. So so Sam's hurt and he knows he's been shot. So what does Daniel do? He decides to reload his dad's gun and shoot him again. But wait. After shooting Sam, he takes his phone, texts Julie to get her to meet him at Sam's place that evening, somewhere around midnight, then proceeds to kill Julie in the same fashion this time using her to frame Sam. But wait, what did Dan do between shooting Sam and shooting Julie? This mofo drove to Fullerton, California theater and acts as the lead role in that nine musical that night. But wait, 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 wait. Where are we at? Where are we at? So what, Dan shoots Sam. Dan texts Julie, pretending to be Sam. Dan goes to the theater and performs. Julie meets Dan thinking it's Sam. Dan shoots Julie framing Sam and Dan goes home to sleep. Then Dan wakes up, goes back to Sam, decapitates and dismembers Sam's body. If you're Dwight Schrute, you're calling him the overkill killer. Then goes back to Fullerton, performs again for night two of that same musical and afterwards joins the after party with the cast and the crew, and they're sitting there celebrating what an incredible weekend of performances for everybody, and even more so for Dan, the piece of shit Wozniak. All for a stack of cash that Sam had saved up from the military, and what Daniel proclaims was an act of insanity, cue the Joker laughter. <sighs> This fucking guy, dude. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm sorry for the uh, the language now, but you, you think about all this guy wanted was some money so he could go off and, you know, go on this beautiful cruise for their honeymoon. And, and you guys, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Money is not the answer to all your problems. Uh, but I am happy to say that not only was he convicted for both murders of Sam Hare and Julie Kibuishi, he was also sentenced to death in 2016 for those same murders. So there we have it. Um, obviously, he's still on death row, but he's going to pay. He's going to pay for it. And uh, lucky for you guys, you guys don't have to pay for this podcast because we are not sponsored by anybody this episode. But if we were, uh, you probably would have already heard it. Anyways, you guys, thank you, thank you for joining uh, the True Crime Banter podcast. Uh, it's been a it's been a fun first episode, been a fun one. If you guys did enjoy it, uh, whatever platform you're on or listening to this, to hit it, hit that like button if you can. I guess on the the video podcast on YouTube, uh, subscribe if you loved it, and you know share it, share it, leave a review. Um, all those things help out. I uh, really appreciate you guys listening and. And yeah, I hope to hear you or see you or uh, get some responses from you guys for the next one. Um, We should see you here in two weeks. My name's Riley. This has been the True Crime Banter Podcast, and we will be seeing you guys in the next one. Take care.